you're not going to want to miss a minute of today's video because we're talking all about functional exercise, stretching, and neuroplasticity to help us manage our symptoms and to help us regain function. I'm thrilled to be welcoming back Dr. Gretchen Ollie. She's a physical therapist and multiple sclerosis certified specialist. She has a special interest in management and wellness of MS patients, helping to improve balance, walking, and energy. Dr. Gretchen developed an online MS wellness program specifically geared towards helping people with MS in their own home. She uses social media to create more awareness around MS and neuroplasticity exercises that can help improve the quality of life for individuals living with MS worldwide. Welcome back, Dr. Gretchen. Thank you so much for having me. It's awesome to be here again. Oh, I'm thrilled to have you back. Hey, congratulations on the first anniversary of the book, The Missing Link, which yeah. I have here and just recently came out with a new audio book. Yes, thank you so much. I can't, you know, part of me can't believe that it's already been a year. And then another part feels like, yeah, that's about right. But the audio book was the most recent version, which was so exciting because Everything that I stand for is all about accessibility. And one of the first questions I got when I launched the book was, will this be available in audiobook? So as soon as I heard that, I was like, yes, just give me time. <laughs> and now that's out too. That's great. That's good news, especially for those who have a hard time reading or with the cognitive functions to have a voice in their head telling them exactly what to do. It's so wonderful. with me. Yes. All right. So I'm going to jump right in. I've been seeing a lot of information and research lately on neuroplasticity and functional exercise. Or first, can you briefly explain what neuroplasticity is? Yes, neuroplasticity is the possibility and capability of our brain to do one of two things. One thing is that it can strengthen our neural pathways. And then the second thing is it can find new neural pathways. So just to break that down a little bit further, for any muscle to move, for us to extend an arm out, pick a leg up, lift our toes up. For anything to happen, our brain first to ha first has to have the thought of pick up my leg. Then that message has to travel down a bunch of neural pathways to the muscle. Then once the muscle gets that message, it will move. But with MS, those neural pathways are demyelinated. So that often results in that message never making it all the way down to the muscle, or it does, but it's just a small, quiet message, not this big, loud message that allows your leg to move. So neuroplasticity is the ability to strengthen those neural pathways. So it's nice, big, and loud message, and your muscle moves the way you want it to. Or if there's so much demyelination that that's just not going to happen, Neuroplasticity is also the ability of your brain to find a new neural pathway. So instead of just keep trying to make that same neural pathway work, it can go around and find a different way to make that muscle move. That's awesome. Thank you so much. And it's so exciting that what we now know that our brains can change and they can find new pathways. You know, there I don't think it was that long ago where they said, oh, it's damaged, it's never going to come back. You know, that's just the way it is. So talk to us a little bit about how functional exercise works with neuroplasticity and can we regain function permanently? This is a great question because one of the best ways to get neuroplasticity working is through exercise. But not only that, research is now showing specifically in people with MS that the type of exercise that is most likely to not just help you get stronger, but also make your walking easier and your day-to-day -day activities feel easier and less cumbersome is through functional exercise. So what that means is you take a goal that you're working towards, and we'll just go with the example of walking because 99% of my clients are looking to improve their walking. So you take the goal of walking and you break walking down into as many individual movements as possible. And those individual movements are now your exercises. And I'll do a, a demonstration here in a second. But before I forget to get to your question of, is it possible to make permanent changes? Yes, absolutely. The thing with MS, though, as we all know, is it's so variable. And so it's very possible to see improvements. And then maybe you have 
a relapse or a progression of the disease that kind of knocks you down a bit, but then you can get back up to where you were before, especially if it's from a flare from the flu or a cold or stress, heat, things like that. Um, but let me demonstrate what I mean by functional exercise because I'm a very visual learner. Okay, so if we're talking about walking, in order for me to take a single step forward like that, it requires lots of different things. It's not just as simple as practicing walking or even practicing taking a single step. That could be an exercise that you do. But to turn this into functional exercises, we need to break it down into all of the components necessary. So we're going to do that together. In order for me to move this leg forward, what I need to do is first shift my body weight forward. If I keep all of my weight on this leg and I try to lift it up to move it forward, I'm going to fall backwards. So I have to be able to shift my weight onto this front leg. So that's the first thing. The second thing is I need to be able to bend my knee back here. The third thing is I need to lift my toes up. The fourth thing is to bring my knee up. Fifth is to straighten my knee. Sixth is to put my heel down. And all while that was happening, I was standing on one leg. And I was wobbling a little bit. I don't know if you could see or not. So single leg balance. So to recap, that's seven movements that it takes to just move one leg forward. Now, the way to view that as exercise is that each of those seven movements can now be an exercise that you do. So if we take that first one of weight shifting, this could be an exercise that you do. You're standing up tall, your core is engaged. You can use a mobility aid if you need to, but you're just practicing moving your weight forward and backward, and you do the same on the other side. Another example, let's pick what one of the other actions was marching, was bringing your knee up. So you could practice using a mobility aid if you need to, of course, uh, marching, bringing your leg up and down, up and down. And it doesn't matter how much movement you have. The thing that matters most is how much effort you're putting in. But with those seven movements, that's now seven exercises that you could do that each of them would help you with things like walking, climbing stairs, stepping up on a curb, you name it. Excellent. I love that. Seven distinct parts of walking, like seven functions that you think is just one function, walking. You know, it's interesting. I think I've heard you say before, people with MS will do a lot of exercise, but then their walking's not improving. They're on the recumbent bike for hours and hours, but their walking's not improving. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. And that is one really great way to know if you're doing the, the right type of exercise or not. If you resonated with what Vicki just said, and if you're like, yeah, I've been getting stronger, but walking's just as hard, or I'm tripping just as much, more likely than not, you are doing exercises, which is great. You know, exercising of any shape, way, shape, and form is great, but you're probably not doing functional exercises. So Functional exercises has the goal of improving your function or your daily activities. Step number one is getting the functional exercises like we just discussed. But you can break down any goal or activity like that. So if you're looking to get in your car without using your arms to lift your leg, break that movement down. If you're looking to stand up from low or squishy surfaces without plopping back down, there's exercises for that. Break that down. But another component that could be why you're not noticing improvements throughout your day is if you're not doing those exercises in a functional location. And I want to share a quick story because I feel like it's a great picture of what we're talking about here. So I was working with a patient in the physical therapy clinic who was working on standing up with more strength and plopping, less plopping down. And she was doing great at this goal. We were doing tons of exercises. We'd been working on it for probably two or three months. She was doing so well that we almost discharged that goal and started working on other things. But right before we did that, her husband came into the PT session with her and he said, Dr. Gretchen, I don't know what magic you're doing in here, but I see her doing this with you and she's doing it great. 
but we get home and she can't do it. She's still plopping down every time. And as soon as he said that, I was like, oh, of course, because every time we're doing these exercises, she's sitting in the same room in the same chair. You have to switch up the locations to make it more realistic because a brain and spinal cord that has MS doesn't have the same carryover, meaning you could get full strength here. I'm in my office right now exercising. I could have full strength here, but I could get out to my car and I don't lift my leg in the same way. And so with this in patient uh, that I was working with, we went to the neurologist's office across the hall and started doing the exercises there. It happened to be springtime. So we went outside to a bench and we started doing the exercises there. Even within the PT clinic, we chose different chairs. So we switched it up and I had her practicing those exercises in the specific locations at home where she wanted to not plop down anymore. That that makes so much sense. Like if if we want to practice getting in and out of the car, doing the exercises on a bench is not going to help. We need to practice getting in and out of the car with the car. That's so smart. Uh, you said one thing earlier that kind of stuck in my brain about lifting your foot during the walking stride. We have to lift up our leg and, and pull our foot forward. What if that foot doesn't come, come forward? How does neuroplasticity work to get us to raise our foot? You know, what do we need to do to reinforce that and get it to work? So there's two things. One is repetition, even if there's no movement, which can be so hard. It's so much easier said than done. But what I mean by that is even if your knee isn't bending or if your foot isn't coming up, still practice that movement as an exercise. Just because it's not moving, it's not a free pass to skip it and move on to a different thing, which leads me to my second point, which is effort is what's required to get those neural pathways working. So typically when we're exercising and we're thinking of what a successful movement is, we base it on how much movement we see. Like if you're trying to lift your foot up and it lifts a lot, we are thinking like, yes, awesome job. You're doing so great. But if it barely lifts, you feel like, oh, that's not working. What's next? But when it comes to MS and neuroplasticity, strengthening those neural pathways requires the effort that you're putting in. So even if it's barely lifting, if you feel like I'm putting in 100% effort, that's what success is. So repetition of practicing the movements that are challenging, even if they're not moving and putting 100% effort in. Excellent. I love it. I, I like envisioning my brain trying really hard, like the little engine that could. I think I can. I think I can. And then finally, it finds a way to get up that hill. That's awesome. Right. And there's other ways too, like to modify the exercise. It could just be that the position that you're in is too challenging for you right now. And so maybe it would be best for you to practice lifting your foot up when you're lying down in bed or on a couch, or if you're lying on your side or sitting versus standing. So there's always a way to modify movements. Just find the way that you feel most successful at initially, and then work your way to the most functional position. Excellent advice. So along with functional exercise, you talk a bit about stretching and there's three different kinds of stretching. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. And actually what we should probably discuss before the types is what you're stretching. So often I'm working with a client and they'll say, Dr. Gretchen, I'm stretching all day long every day, but I'm still so tight. Like what gives? What's going on here? And so my first question to them is, great, tell me what stretches you're doing. And without fail, they do tell me like six, seven, eight stretches. That's a lot of stretches. But typically, not any of them are for the specific area where they have spasticity or muscle tightness. And so it's really important that you are stretching the muscles that are tight, not just stretching to stretch. Um, So that's step number one. But then we can move on to the different types of stretching. So... Type number one, in no particular order, is static stretching. And this is probably what most people think of when we think of stretching. And it just means you're holding for about 20 to 30 seconds, and then you back off, and then you do that again. And you do that between two and four times for each leg. 
Another type is dynamic stretching. And this would be more of holding the stretch only for about three seconds and then backing off and then stretch again and then back off. And again, and you do that about 20 to 30 repetitions. And then the third type is prolonged static. So this means you're going to hold the stretch for three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, even sometimes up to seven minutes. The latter type, that prolonged stretching, prolonged static, is what has been found most recently in research to be best for more intense levels of spasticity. But everyone's going to be different. So I always recommend people trying one type and then analyze how you feel later that day and the next day, and then try the, a different type. And how did you feel later that day or the next day? And then pick whichever one helped you feel most flexible. I love that. Prolonged stretching is my personal favorite. I have a muscle, uh, my trapezius, that gets a knot when I get stressed. And I work with a physical therapist on it. And she, she gave me a stretch to do. And she says, you have to hold it for two minutes or it's not going to work. <laughs> so I love the prolonged stretching. So um, just to, to wrap it up, talk a little bit about how these all work together, functional exercising, stretching, and neuroplasticity. So without getting too intricate, they all work together for any goal of movement that you have. So in order to move, we need our neural pathways to work. In order to get your neural pathways to work, we often need strength and flexibility and then we can also add in things like balance and stamina and speed. So there's lots of different types of exercise. But what it often boils down to is strengthening and flexibility. Because in order to lift a leg or bend a knee or even if it's upper body, you need strength in that muscle and flexibility in the opposite muscle. So for example, to bend your knee, you need strength in your hamstrings on the back of your knee and flexibility on the front of your thigh, which is in your quad muscles. So it for every action, there's a strengthening and stretching exercise that you can do to get that to work and to activate your neural pathways. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, tell our viewers a little bit about the Missing Link program and if there's anything new happening. Yes, absolutely. This is actually really exciting because we do have lots of new things happening. So the Missing Link program is my online MS wellness program that is a membership style. And I've found that in educating on neuroplasticity and functional exercise, people get it, but they don't understand exactly what exercises to do for their symptoms or their goals. And so that's what the program is for. There's tons of MS specific exercises in there with calendars that tell you what exercises to do, and there's also a bunch of MS-specific physical therapy-based classes. So if you're more of a class person, you can just press play and do the class right then and there. And we're actually going to be offering weekly live exercise classes instead of just monthly live classes. So that's really exciting. We've got monthly live Q&As, so you can have all of your questions answered. And we have a new app coming out that is going to be really great for our community that we have and for sharing wins and successes and any questions and really creating that community with easy access to everything all in one place. Oh, that's really exciting and out. Oh, wow, that's great. And tell everybody, where can they find you? So you can find me either uh, as Dr. Dot Gretchen or The Missing Link on lots of different platforms. I have a podcast called The Missing Link. My website is missinglink.com. And I have a YouTube video and Instagram channel. Both are Dr. Gretchen. All right. And The Missing Link is the M-S-I-N-G-L-I-N-K. So thank you again, Dr. Gretchen. I'm so happy to have had you again. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for today's video. If you like videos like this, please share the video and don't forget to subscribe and like. Until next time, be well.